I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to this uh, lecture this afternoon sponsored by the Charles Red Center for Western Studies here on campus. I'm Brian Cannon and then I'm the director of the center. It's my privilege to introduce our guest speaker this afternoon. Uh, Mark Fiji is a professor of history and holds the William E. Morgan Chair of Liberal Arts at Colorado State University. He uh, uh, received his bachelor's degree from Western Washington University, his master's from Washington State, and his PhD in 1994 from the University of Utah. Professor Fiji will be speaking to us today about his book, The Republic of Nature, An Environmental History of the United States. He's also uh, the author of numerous other articles and a book, Irrigated Eden, The Making of an Agricultural Landscape in the American West. Uh, he's won a lengthy list of prizes that I covet. <laughs> uh, they include the Theodore Blegin Award from the Forest History Society, the Wayne D. Rasmussen Award from the Agricultural History Society, the Alice Hamilton Prize from the American Society for Environmental History, the Oscar O. Winther Award from the Western History Association, the Charles Weyerhaeuser Award from the Forest History Society, and the Best Book Award from the Idaho Library Association. So quite uh, a list of, of honors. Uh, he's a wonderful scholar and a good friend. Uh, we met when we were both in graduate school years ago and um, uh, we're at a conference in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Fiji. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, thanks to the Charles Red Center uh, for having me. Thanks to Michael McLean and the Utah Humanities Council for helping to bring me out. Really appreciate being able to speak here at BYU. I did get my PhD at the University of Utah. Um, living and working in Utah um, had a pretty powerful uh, 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 impact on how I think about history, um, the kinds of work that I do. Um, I'm trained in United States history and the history of the American West and environmental history history. And it's that background that really uh, came into play when I wrote this book, The Republic of Nature. Um, so this book, um, which I'll speak about, um, is an unconventional approach to environmental history. Um, it, it, what it tries to do is bring the perspective of environmental history, the kinds of questions environmental historians ask, the subject matter upon which they often focus their attention, to subjects, to topics that environmental historians usually don't pay much attention to. So some of you are in the U.S. History Survey class. Uh, some of you are taking Professor Cannon's uh, Utah History class. And you'll probably know that most historians are Civil War historians, or they're historians of the American Revolution, or they're historians of Utah, or they're historians of American politics, um, those kinds of topical categories. Um, and then over on the other side are environmental historians. And these people focus on the role and place of nature in human life through time and environmental historians don't typically look at the Civil War. They don't typically think about the American Revolution. Um, they don't typically think about American politics and that kind of subject matter. Environmental historians usually are concerned with forests and national parks and wilderness areas and the conservation movement and agriculture and wildlife and topics such as that. All really great topics. I love teaching about them myself. Um, I'm, a real, uh, I'm re very interested in conservation, for example, and I love to lecture on that topic and talk to my students about it and things like that. Um, I love the national parks, as I'm sure many of you do, who visit them and things like that. Those are all conventional environmental history approaches. But what really has almost never been done very much is to bring together environmental history with those other areas, the Civil War or the American Revolution or um, the Civil Rights Movement, for example. Um, so if you're in your US survey, you're probably getting those kind of topics. And what I've tried to do is bring the perspectives of environmental history over into those topics. And it's kind of unusual. Um, it puts me in a rather uncomfortable position um, because in effect, I'm trying to break genres. I'm trying to step outside of the usual ways that people think and do things. And there's enormous potential. That approach can be very fruitful. All kinds of interesting insights and ideas arise from that, uh, but it also goes against the grain of the way people 
expect to, to see things. So if you're studying the Civil War, you expect to hear about the armies and the battles, the causes of the war. Um, you expect to hear something about the Confederacy, the condition of slavery, and so forth. And then when someone comes in and says, hey, there's an environmental history to the Civil War. Nature somehow mattered to the Civil War. Sometimes it's hard, I think, for people to receive that idea, to see that concept. And so it's not something they expect. So that's the difficulty I have in trying to bring environmental history, migrated over, so to speak, into these other topics. But here's the interesting story. Um, here's a really interesting feature of this. What prompted me to do this, what prompted me to start this project, was not, were not colleagues in the field. They were not other historians. They were students. An important prompt for this project to write this book came from people such as yourselves, from my own students. And here's what happened. This must have been 1997, 1998. It's a long time ago. It took me a long time to write this book. <laughs> and I was teaching my course in American environmental history. And we were looking at the kinds of, of things that you get in an environmental history course. Um, we were looking at the coming of Europeans to the New World, um, the biological exchanges of plants and other organisms, um, the effects of diseases on native communities. Um, we were looking at uh, the uh, deforestation of the United States. We were looking at mining. We were looking at cattle grazing, the near extinction of the buffalo herds, conservation national parks, all that great stuff. I mean, I love it. Um, and then one day after class, a couple of students came up to me. And these students weren't history majors. My American environmental history class usually has only a handful of history students. I don't know why. I think it's because history students think that this is going to be a class about environmentalism or something like that. And Dr. Fiji must be an environmentalist, and I don't want that. And it's not really what it is. You know, it's really about the, the biological and geological and physical basis of, of human history. Um, but these two students, they weren't history majors. They came from the College of Natural Resources. So they were natural resources management majors, students who were taking courses in forestry and wildlife management and topics such as that. And I think that might be why they came to me. They approached me after class one day, and they challenged me. And these were two young women. I'm sorry I don't remember their names. But they came up to me and said, Dr. Fiji. And I said, yes. And they said, you say this is a course on American history. And I said, that's right. And they said, well, if this is American history, how come we're not studying? And the two topics they mentioned were the American Revolution and the Civil War. I think it may have something to do with the fact they weren't history majors, but they had some general notion of what American history was. If it's American history, if it's a class on American history, it has to have something on the revolution, right? What else, what's more American than the American Revolution or the Civil War? But those were the two, first two topics that came into their minds. And so these young women said, we want American Revolution and Civil War. And I said, well, here's what environmental history is. I mean, environmental historians ask about nature and its role and place in human life. And when they ask that question, sometimes other topics, other subjects um, come to the fore, rise to the top, so to speak, become more important, more salient. And when you put those, those uh, things together, you get a different story of American history. And I said to him, and that's what I'm trying to do with this class. And you know what? They would not accept my answer. They pushed back. And they said, no, no, no. You know, we want you to explain to us the environmental history of the Civil War. Um, and so I had to start thinking about what they said. I took it seriously. And I, these thoughts had occurred to me before, even from when I was a student. Um, why do we have in the environmental history of forests in the 19th century, say, but then suddenly that, that kind of inquiry stops when you get to the boundary of the Civil War? So didn't people use trees back then during the Civil War? Didn't they use forests? Didn't they have draft animals? Didn't they get crops off the landscape? Um, wasn't their weather and climate affecting what they were doing and so forth? So yeah, those thoughts had occurred to me. Um, but I never really crystallized it. It had never come to a focus the way those two young women brought it to a focus for me after that class one day. And again, I regret I don't remember their names. Um, they were really smart. I remember they were really good students. And um, they were stubborn, the way students ought to be. You know, question your professors. That was great. And so I started to take it seriously. And I thought, well, what would, a civil, what would an environmental history of the Civil War look like? Um, what would this look like? And that was the genesis of this book. 
And when I originally imagined doing this book, um, I thought, well, you know, I'll make this comprehensive, this massive survey of all of American history, because that's the kind of person I am. Um, you, you know, as, as Whitman said, I, I, I contain multitudes, you know, I love it all. And then I got some advice from some editors and the chair of my department um, who said, no, don't do that. You've got to find a more focused, interesting way to bring this message to readers. And so what they suggested and what I worked with was the idea of picking some select moments, famous events, famous turning points, famous people in American history, and then retelling these well-known, iconic, I call them, events and people as environmental history. So basically what I did is I sat down with the US survey textbook and I began to flip through the chapters and I began to ask myself, well, what are some really prominent events and themes? What kinds of topics in here might interest a young person, a history major, or someone who's just coming into history as a, a subject? Um, and I began to draw up a list. And so the book that I wrote has nine chapters, nine major chapters. There's nothing magic about nine. Originally, I was even thinking about 15, um, so that there would be one chapter for each week in a 15-week week semester, and that didn't work out. I mean, the, the nine chapters span the breadth of American history, um, but they're basically the nine I could complete um, before I died. Um, so <laughs> it took me a lot of work to write this book. I mean, I started it, the idea came into my head with the help of these students in 1997. So what, that's 16 years ago that this started. And I, I think I was, a, I, was a, I was much younger then, um, and I, I would say I was, uh, um, you know, uh, um, I was a lot less humble than I am now. So here I finished the book, and I'm, I'm older, and I'm humbler, and much more appreciative of how much labor goes into scholarship. It can take a long time. Um, but these were the nine chapters I was able to put together. So if you open the book, um, the book opens up, and you're actually with me in this story that I, you start to tell in the opening of the book. You're with me at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., which I think is a powerful symbol of American history. Uh, have any of you been to the Lincoln Memorial? I mean, wow, quite a few of you. That's really impressive. You know, it's that Parthenon-like marble building up there. And in many ways, that is a symbol of America. That is one of the most powerful transcendent symbols of American history. Um, I, every time I go to Washington, D.C., I visit the Lincoln Memorial. And every time, I am deeply moved um, by what I see there. And so you open up the book, and you're with me, and we're walking up. You're with me, and we're walking up those steps, and we're going into that temple, essentially. Um, and, and we're feeling all of the things that Americans feel when they go into that site. But when we're in there, we actually begin to notice what that building, what that monument, what that temple is made of. And it's really interesting. You start asking questions. Where does that marble come from? Um, what's that green stuff, that algae-like stuff growing in the cracks? in that marble? What about those plants all the way around that building? And then when you ask those questions and you try to come up with the answers to those questions, the environmental history of that building, of the Lincoln Memorial, emerges. And it turns out, I didn't know this, but much of the marble from the Lincoln Memorial is quarried up in the mountains, the, the Rockies of my home state, Colorado. Um, so literally, the Lincoln Memorial is built from pieces of the American landscape. It's a powerful story, and that's the opening. Um, and then you're with me and we walk out of the memorial, and I say, look, here's this vast landscape of American history. Come with me and let's explore some of the iconic events in the nation's past, and we'll see what role nature played in them. So then we go through the nine chapters, and they range from colonial New England witchcraft to the Declaration of Independence and the American Revolution. Um, to the cultivation, cultivation of, of cotton and the spread of slavery across the American South, to the life of Abraham Lincoln, um, to the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War, to the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, first Pacific Railroad, where the rails met up here in this state in northern Utah, the Promontory Mountains, in 1869. Um, from there, we go into the 20th century. We go into the making of the atomic bomb, 
Who would have thought the atomic bomb has an environmental history? Here's a really interesting one. We go to Topeka, Kansas to study the famous landmark civil rights case, Brown v. Board of Education. What does civil rights have to do with the environment? Um, then we go to uh, the nation's first so-called oil shock, 1973-1974. Most of you in this room won't remember that. Um, some of you um, more in my stage of life will remember it. Um, this was the first time that the United States experienced the consequences of its dependence on foreign oil, especially oil that came from the Middle East, and there were shortages. And long lines of cars appeared at gas stations around the country. Iconic event. Just the photograph, just the picture of long lines of cars stretching away from service stations, sitting there waiting for their turn to get their tanks filled, um, became an iconic picture of American history. Um, so that's what I tried to do with, with the book. That was the organization. And in all these topics, I asked the question that those two young women essentially had put to me, and that is, what's nature got to do with it? What's nature got to do with it? Now, I should say, what's really interesting is that, on the one hand, this is a difficult challenge for any author, because you're, you're crossing genres. You know, genres are accepted categories of thought and expression. You know, different kinds of art or music, literature, different kinds of history, Civil War history and the histories of, of the American environment. How do you bring those together? That's a challenge because sometimes people, I think, have difficulty understanding that. But the really cool thing, the really interesting thing, is, is that kind of exchange, crossing the boundary, can be very fruitful. All kinds of interesting ideas, all kinds of interesting questions and insights occur to you when you do that kind of thing. And that's what I did with the book. The interesting thing is, I'm not alone. I discovered this as I worked on the book. There are other historians, and, and the, the light bulbs clicked on in their heads at virtually the same time as the light bulb clicked on in mine. So for example, there are a whole bunch of historians who are younger historians. They tend to be younger, um, closer to being students. And they are looking at the environmental history of slavery. And think about it, slavery. Um, this isn't an abstraction. This is a powerful, important event, development in American history. And you have people outside working the landscape. They're outside in the weather. They're growing cotton. They're growing rice. They're growing tobacco. They're growing sugar cane. Um, that's out there in nature, I would say. That's out there in the environment. And so that idea that somehow slavery might have an environmental history has also occurred to others. Um, and sometimes I think these people are unaware of each other. But I'm taking this broader view, and I'm starting to see these connections. I'm starting to see that I've got friends out there, and they are not aware of me. <laughs> they're not aware that they've got a friend in me. Um, some historians of the Civil War, believe it or not, and these tend to be younger historians. Um, they are looking at the environmental history of the Civil War. Um, so I, I'm not alone in this. Um, there's a, a young guy named Jim Downs. Um, and he's a history professor, and he wrote a book called Sick from Freedom. And this is a story of emancipation. This is a story of what happens beginning in 1865 when all those people who had been enslaved were suddenly liberated because of the end of the Civil War. Think of it. That's really a very positive story in American history. The significant portion of the American population suddenly is free, and slavery is over. Um, this is something that's celebrated. Um, this is part of the overall story of American progress and so forth. Um, the coming of freedom, coming of emancipation. And what Downs did was to look what happened to these people, look what happened to their lives and their health when that happened. And he said, yeah, it was a great thing. These people are liberated. But what happens when slavery ends is all these people begin to move. Think of it. They're looking for lost family members. They're roaming around the countryside looking for children and mothers and fathers, brothers, sisters, etc. They're also looking for work. They're going to try to have to figure out how they're going to recreate their lives after slavery. And any time you've had a war, this is something that environmental historians had missed. Any time you have a war and you have refugee populations, those refugee populations usually spread illness. And so 
Tragically, one of the first experiences of freedom for the newly freed people was illness, smallpox, and other diseases. Thus, Downs' title, Sick from Freedom. Now, Downs doesn't identify himself as an environmental historian. I don't think he's teaching a class that has something on wildlife or John Muir in the national parks or wilderness or things like that. Um, Downs is a social historian. He studies working people. He, he studies race and ethnicity. Um, he studies slavery, etc. And Downs later talked to a New York Times reporter and he said, basically, when someone has smallpox, that person does not have agency. That person does not have the power to determine the circumstances of his or her life. Now, when Professor Downs said that in the pages of the New York Times, to me, that was a powerful validation of environmental history. It shows that disease, a biological organism, really can matter to the circumstances of people's lives. He wasn't an environmental historian. He was a, a US social and labor historian. Um, in saying that, so, so I'm not I'm not alone. Um, there there are others who, who are, are doing this kind of work. Um, when I was a graduate student up at the University of Utah, I worked with a professor named Richard White, and the hall that we the history department was located in Carlson Hall has now been destroyed. It's been torn down. They're expanding the law school, so it's gone. It's a giant gaping hole. But I was inside Carlson Hall with my advisor, my mentor. Um, Professor White and I was sitting there talking to him and he was talking to me about environmental history and he opened up an older book um, and I believe it was by Gilbert Fight, The Farmer's Frontier. I think that was the book, uh, Brian. And he opened it up and this was a book that had been published 50, 60 years before maybe, something like that. You know, it was an old book and he opened it up and the first chapter was titled Nature and the Farmer. It was a history of American agriculture, a history of American farming, but Professor White was pointing out to me that right there in this older book, an historian had been concerned with nature. And he said, really, he said, in some ways, environmental history isn't new. People have been aware of these things. It's just that environmental historians bring it out. They put it and they, out in front, they make it front and central in the stories that they tell about the past. Um, so one of the things that I did when I wrote The Republic of Nature was to revisit a lot of those texts, a lot of those older books, um, in which historians, way back when, 40, 50, 60 years ago, in fact, were starting to ask the kinds of questions I was asking. So one of the books that I came across in the course of doing this book um, was by Daniel Borston, an old guy. He's gone now. But in the late 1940s, he wrote a book titled The Lost World, of Thomas Jefferson. Very evocative title, The Lost World of Thomas Jefferson. The world that Jefferson had lived in and created was now gone. And Borston, Professor Borston, was going to try to evoke it, recreate it for us. You open that book, you start looking at it, and one of the chapters is titled, The Natural History of a New Society. The Natural History of a New Society. He was using that word natural to discuss colonial and revolutionary America, Jefferson's time. I think there was an historian right there who's trying to do the things I was doing. So there's an older basis to this too, so I'm not alone. Um, but the challenge always is to get people to see history a little bit differently, uh, to get people to see history in ways that uh, maybe they hadn't seen before. Um, so um, let me talk about some of the topics in the book. Um, some of these may be familiar to you. Um, so I've got these nine chapters, and I think the chapter on the railroad, um, Iron Horses is the title of it, might be appropriate since we're in Utah. Um, but maybe if you open up you, your U.S. survey textbook, um, or maybe you open up a textbook on Utah history and you see that event, 1869, and if you went up to the Promontory Mountains where the two rails met, you'd see two locomotives that were pointing toward each other. Two locomotives and the cow catchers kind of touching. You know, they come together. And that was the culmination of this larger project to build a railroad across the American West. So imagine from Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska, building westward across the Great Plains into the Rocky Mountains is the Union Pacific Railroad. Um, building those tracks up the prairie, up the Platte Valley, um, up into the Rocky Mountains, heading 
westward to some indeterminate point where the Union Pacific Line would meet the eastward moving tracks of the Central Pacific Railroad, which had begun on the waterfront in Sacramento, California. So these two railroad lines building into the west and they're going to meet. Um, they finally meet up there in the Promontory Mountains. And there are those locomotives. So that is an iconic scene. That scene, that photograph appears in many, many textbooks. Many people understand that. Wow, the West at last is spanned by the railroads. It's the coming of this modern age. It's the establishment of the United States' control across the American West. It connects the interior in the Midwest and the east of the United States to the Pacific Coast, and so forth and so on. There it is, those two locomotives. Take a look at that picture again. On one side, it's the locomotive that's pointed west. Um, that locomotive has a straight stack. It's a stack that goes up just like this. That's the Union Pacific's number 119. Yeah, they like to name the locomotives, and the Union Pacific just gave them numbers. But on the other side, and it's the locomotive that's pointed east. That's the Central Pacific's locomotive, and its name was the Jupiter. So there's the Jupiter, and the Jupiter has a different kind of smokestack. It's got kind of a bonnet, a gigantic funnel-like smokestack on it. And inside that smokestack are some screens. And those screens are spark arresters. And they catch the sparks that are thrown out of the firebox in that locomotive, which is burning wood. Now the 119 didn't burn wood. The number 119 burned coal. So one locomotive burning wood, the other locomotive burning coal. And that juxtaposition, that coming together of those two locomotives encapsulates a really powerful story of global significance. And that story is the transition from older energy sources to the fossil fuels. So it's called the energy transition. So if you want to throw some big words around, impress your friends, say, yeah, you know, let's talk about the energy transition. The transition. So historians often will, will talk about this. It's the transition from energy sources such as wind, you know, that would drive windmills, um, water power turning water wheels, um, animals pulling wagons, and so forth. Um, those are older energy sources, or the burning of wood. So you can boil water to create steam, um, to create the pressure that drives the mechanical movement of the locomotive. But the leaving behind of that older world and the adoption of coal and later oil is the energy transition. And right there in those locomotives, you can see that event encapsulated, a story of global significance. So there it is, the energy transition. Very cool. That was my insight. I was proud of myself for, for having get, gotten that insight. But the story actually goes deeper in really interesting ways. So to build the Pacific Railroad, to build the Transcontinental Railroad, required an enormous amount of muscle power. So think about it. You had to have tens of thousands of human laborers to do simple physical work. This is the day before tractors. It's a time before automobiles. You don't have backhoes. You don't have caterpillar tractors. You don't have steam shovels, all that kind of stuff. What you have is sheer brute force labor provided by people. So each side had maybe 10 to 12,000 laborers. And their description is those of those laborers doing their work. They would often work in unison. Men lined up in rows of hundreds, all wielding the shovel at the same time. Because you had to move earth to clear away rock to build the roadbed for the railroad. Not only that, but each side had a comparable number of horses and mules. So think 10, 12,000 men, picks, shovels, dynamite, literally moving earth, and working with them, horses and mules of a similar number. So muscle power was required to build this modern mechanical industrial technology. Think of it. And I think in most people's minds, the adoption of modern technologies necessarily involved a loss of older ways of doing things, of older muscle power draft animals and so forth, right? It seems to be sort of this progressive story. We get the railroad, later we get automobiles, and with each new technology, we leave behind some of those animals, right? And till today, we live in this fully mechanized world. And if you have horses or mules, it's largely for, for recreation. That story is wrong. That story is wrong. And here's what happened. 
industrialization and the adoption of railroads for 50 or 60 years actually increased the number of draft animals in America. Every 10 years, the United States takes a census, and it counts the numbers of people, but the census counts a lot of other things too, and one of the things that it counted were the numbers of horses and mules in the country. Equids, equine, you know, equine, the equids, horses and mules. Guess which census recorded the most ever equids, horses and mules, in American history? It wasn't 1880, after the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. It wasn't 1890. It wasn't 1900. It wasn't 1910, which puts you right in the moment where the United States had about the most railroad track mileage in its history, about a quarter of a million miles. It wasn't 1910. It was 1920. 1920 was the year when the That was after the... Henry Ford had begun to produce automobiles. That's when the United States had the most horses and mules in its history. So the interesting thing is industrialization actually stimulated the use of muscle power to build the tracks, to build the railroads, to build the factories. Before automobiles and power machinery, you had to have some kind of mechanical force, and only muscle power could supply that. Only muscle power could do that. So think about it. For a brief time, horses and mules actually increased. In 1920, there was about 108 million Americans. There's about 25 million horses and mules. So there's a horse and a mule for about one in every four Americans. It's really interesting. You know, if we could go back to 1910, most of us would have direct experience, probably direct daily experience in one form or another with the draft animal. We'd be harnessing it. We'd be having it pull a, a, a wagon at work or at home or we'd be riding in some kind of conveyance that was pulled by one of those animals. And that's after the Industrial Revolution begins. Very cool story, very interesting story. It was really fun to write that chapter because I could get into the worlds of those workmen and their animals, their horses. And it has that surprising answer to it. You know, lots of, lots of draft animals, 1920. And it's at the same time, 1920, the workforce doing that kind of labor peaked in the United States. And thereafter, it began to decrease in fewer horses and mules because by then, automobiles, tractors were spreading. Mechanical machinery began to place, replace laborers doing simple muscle power. So there's a story. Transcontinental Railroad, it's a very story of American westward expansion and progress, the establishment of the United States' control over the West. But if you bring the perspective of environmental history to it, a different story appears. A different story emerges. Um, really interesting. Um, so there are other examples of this, um, other examples that I might bring up. Um, one story, very interesting, is the story of um, civil rights in Topeka, Kansas. Um, and this was one place where some citizens in Topeka brought a lawsuit, lawsuit against um, the Topeka Board of Education um, to desegregate the schools. Um, resulted in a larger Supreme Court case, similar complaints in places around the United States in the 1950s, Brown v. Board of Education. What's environmental history about that? You know, I went to that city. I went to Topeka. I went there and did research. I walked around the landscape. I looked at it, and, and I, I came to realize there's a really powerful environmental history story written across the streets and neighborhoods and houses of that city. Um, so if you remember your survey course, um, if you think about American history and we think about race relations and uh, the topic of the color line will come up. You know, you'll hear about segregation and the color line was the, the instrument. The color line was the thing that divided races and kept some people in a subordinate position. Um, and it was the civil rights movement that sought to overcome the color line and establish more equal conditions for all Americans. My argument, my insight, was that the color line is inherently environmental. The color line isn't a, just a legal abstraction. Um, the color line is a way of physically separating people and keeping some people in a subordinate position and depriving them of the kinds of things that they need to thrive. 
So if the classic stories of the color line in the American South, um, laws that would uh, segregate drinking fountains and restrooms, for example. And the fact is that you go into southern cities and there'd be a white drinking fountain, there'd be um, a white restroom, and there wouldn't be any for anyone else. Well, that's a physical thing. You're depriving people of spaces and resources, water, that they need to be able to function in an urban society. Um, so the color line to me was inherently environmental. Um, the color line across the American South um, also attempted to prevent the freed people from getting access to fish and game that they needed to supplement their diets. So some of you are hunting fish, right? Show me hands of people who hunt and fish. Some of you must. Some of you hunt and fish. There are fish and game laws, right? There are seasons. There are bag limits on hunting deer or catching fish, things like that. And, and in a lot of ways, those are conservation measures that are intended to protect the resource. You don't want to catch too much fish, right? If you do, you'll wipe them out. Or, you know, you've got to be careful harvesting too many elk or whatever. There are real reasons for conservation laws such as that. But in the American South, those laws also serve the purpose of preventing freed people from hunting and fishing and gathering. Those conservation laws were uh, as much about controlling access to those resources as they were protecting the resources. So right there, you see the color line is environmental. And it's environmental in, a ways, in ways that are very characteristic of conventional environmental history. It's about wildlife. It's about rural landscapes. Um, it's about deer. It's about fish. Well, that color line, you can follow that color line, and it runs its way out of the American South, off those rural landscapes, up the Mississippi Valley, along the railroad lines, to cities such as Topeka. And after the end of the Civil War, after the end of the period of Reconstruction, a lot of African Americans tried to get out. They left the South. They migrated out. Some of the places they migrated to were cities in Kansas. A lot of them were trying to get out to the Great Plains. They called it an exodus, um, drawing inspiration from the Bible. Um, they called themselves exodusters. Um, they left. They went to Topeka, and that color line followed them there. The color line began to be laid down by laws and by customs um, by people in Kansas. And it began to separate people in Topeka, black and white, from each other. So there were African-American neighborhoods in Topeka really interesting. Some of them had really revealing names. So get this. So there's an African-American neighborhood. There's another one called Sandtown. Another one called The Bottoms. What, what kind of topography do you think those neighborhoods had? Are they high above the river or right down by the river where it floods? Yeah, they're down by the river where it flooded, where Shungananga Creek would flood. Um, so right there in the names of the African-American neighborhoods, you can see an element of the environment at play. So the neighborhoods were separated, and African-Americans ended up in neighborhoods um, defined by their environmental conditions. And it's from those kind of circumstances, it's from those kind of circumstances that the, the opposition to um, school segregation began to arise. So to me, yes, the color line is inherently environmental. Um, there's another example. Um, so are you getting this? So seeing how it's worked, it's, and it's really interesting. Um, a lot of people are very open to this. Um, for other people, it's, it's harder for them to grasp. But you kind of have to make the leap. Um, you got to kind of have to make the leap out there and say there is a way in which nature matters um, to, to events in American history that we might not think it matters. But if you look closely enough, there it is. There it is. Um, another case study, another story. Um, the atomic bomb. What's, what's environmental history about the atomic bomb? So you get these scientists together, these physicists, chemists, a few mathematicians. Um, you bring them out to New Mexico and there they put their heads together and they come up with an extraordinarily powerful weapon. And I think in most people's minds, that's kind of what's, what's natural in that. In fact, maybe this is the antithesis of anything natural, um, these bomb makers. And what I found when I looked at the lives of these people, I found a very interesting and surprising story. And that is that 
These people were people who, in their own way, thought nature was beautiful. They were actually people who spent a lot of time in the mountains. Many of them were mountain climbers, mountaineers. They loved to hike. Um, they, thought, they thought that the nature you see in the everyday world, um, the world up there in the mountains, was quite extraordinary. And that appreciation for natural beauty extended down into the world of atoms. It extended down into the microscopic world that they really couldn't see at all. Um, that appreciation for nature, its wonder, um, its beauty, um, was what compelled them to engage in this kind of geeky, um, esoteric, scientific research. And so rather than being people who didn't like the world, people who were, who were heartless scientists um, wearing white lab coats and just thinking of the world in terms of mathematical abstractions, I would say that they were actually nature lovers. It was nature lovers, ironically, who built the atomic bomb down there in Los Alamos. So the powerful thing about doing this is that you get all kinds of insights. Um, you get all kinds of insights that you otherwise might miss. Okay, so anyway, so there. So yeah, I, I'll take any questions you might have um, about this. Yeah. My favorite chapter to write and why. The fa I think my favorite chapter to write, that's an excellent question, my favorite chapter to write was the one on Abraham Lincoln. And when I started this book, I never imagined that I was going to write a chapter on Lincoln. But I think there's a way in which Lincoln as a subject is hard to avoid when you look at the broad sweep of American history. Um, and it's almost like... Lincoln emerged from my research. I found that he was appearing in various chapters, uh, various pieces, and finally one of my a friends said, hey, I think you need to have a chapter on Lincoln. Um, and what's natural about Lincoln? What's environmental history about Lincoln? Everybody thinks in terms of John Muir or Henry David Thoreau, people like that. Those are the nature guys from the 19th century. Um, but Lincoln? Well, Lincoln's about slavery and the Civil War and stuff like that. But look closely at his life. Um, his life is all about his experience of the American landscape. Um, it's all about his experience of working as a, uh, an agricultural laborer. It's all about his using an ax to cut down forests to spread agriculture. It's about his work as a river boatman and so forth. Um, Lincoln actually said a lot about nature. Um, Lincoln spoke a lot about the natural world and its importance. And he believed that nature had a capacity for what he called improvement. Um, that nature had a potential um, to fulfill. Um, it, that, that, that nature could um, essentially be um, modified, shall we say. Um, and it could be, be used to um, promote um, human health, human well-being, and help support a democracy and a government um, based on representation, a republic, a republican form of government. Um, so there was, there was Lincoln, and it was really fun and interesting to write about. Um, it's, in many ways, the classic story. There's a reason why so many historians are quite taken with Lincoln. We see ourselves in him. Um, here's a guy who comes from ordinary background, um, rises, um, becomes educated, becomes a successful politician, and so forth. He's a self-made man in many ways. And I think Amer many Americans see him and his decency um, as a validation of the American way. So he's a powerful figure, you know, but when you do look at his life, um, he experiences nature and he says a lot about it. Here's a little nugget, here's a little insight about Lincoln. Some historians say the first national park was not Yellowstone, but Yosemite. And there was a, a law passed in Congress establishing the Yosemite Park out there in California. Guess who signed that bill into law? Abraham Lincoln. 1864, the Yosemite Park Act. That was Abraham Lincoln who did that. A surprising nugget. So that was probably the favorite chapter to write. Yeah. Um, as you were talking, this may seem kind of random, but I just want to know if you wrote a chapter on the Wright brothers and how the Outer Banks, how that land affected their 
No, that's actually a good question. The, the Wright brothers and the Outer Banks and, and how that affected their ability to do that. No, I didn't do that. You know, I had to pick nine topics um, and I tried to pick the big block topics. But to say, I would say that you're asking the right question, that in fact there is an environmental history to aviation, really. I think you're asking the right questions. Um, what about the Outer Banks, the beaches, um, enabled the Wright brothers to conduct that experiment? So I would say you're asking the right question. I don't know the answer because I didn't research that. Um, didn't cross my mind. But that's the kind of question I'd like to see more students ask. Yeah, very good. Yeah, question. How do you feel like the geography and the environment of the U.S. shape? That's an excellent question. Did you read my book? No. Okay. <laughs> so if I had a gold star, I'd put it on your forehead. That's really good. Yeah, how did the geography shape the government of the United States? And I think that's a, that's a really powerful question, and there's some really interesting answers to that. Um, so if you go back to the founding of the United States, if you go back to the beginnings of the, the Constitution that we have now, um, there were some of the founders, the founding fathers, so-called, um, James Madison, for example, um, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, it was mostly Madison and Hamilton who wrote these newspaper articles called the Federalist Papers. And everybody, if you go into a political science class, if you haven't taken one, you end up taking one on the origins of American government, you will read Federalist Number 10. And Federalist Number 10 is one of the most famous of those newspaper articles. They're collectively called the Federalist. Um, and it's Madison and, and, and Hamilton writing these things, and they're published in newspapers, and they're trying to convince other Americans to adopt the Constitution. Um, which Americans eventually did. Um, but the idea at, there is that a republic that is of a vast geographic extent is going to be much more stable than a republic of a very small geographic extent. So it's a fundamental problem of statecraft. How do you govern a vast area? And up until that time, the general thinking was republics that have to cover a vast area, they're really unstable. And to be fair, there was some real instability in the American Republic, which was revealed in the Civil War, right? Um, this, the, the Republic almost split apart in the Civil War. But there, the general idea is how do you govern? How do you balance power? Um, how, do you, how do you separate powers um, between a centralized government and then the states dispersed across that landscape? So right there, I think you're, you're putting your finger on a powerful element of American environment that shapes the government. And that whole federal system, having a federal government in Washington, D.C., but then according some power to the states across that vast geographic extent, that's a way of trying to achieve that balance. And without patting ourselves on the back too much, it's a system of government that works. It's had crises, but it's worked reasonably well. So right there. Here's another element of that. Um, Abraham Lincoln and others, Jefferson had believed this. Um, they believed that slavery eventually would have to be eliminated. Um, Lincoln was anti-slavery. And Jefferson first, later Henry Clay, Lincoln became a big proponent of this. He believed that the United States was vast and economically productive enough. In other words, its vast landscape could produce enough wealth that some of that wealth could be taken to purchase, to pay off slaveholders so that they would free their slaves, thus ending the Civil War and its bloodshed. So right there, there was Lincoln's vision, his dream, that the extent of the American landscape could create enough wealth um, that, that the slaveholders could be essentially bought out, and then the, the former slaves could be sent somewhere else. Um, so I think you're asking the right question. The geographic size, the extent of the country, really does have a lot to do with, with uh, um, the environmental history of the nation. Hang on a second. Let's, I think she had her hand up. What surprised me the most? That's a really good question. What surprised me the most? Well, it was full of surprises, things that I didn't expect to see, um, things that um, um, uh, I wasn't sure were there. And sometimes it was just a matter of trying to tell each story, and then I'd come to an insight. Um, and here's one that might interest you who are taking. How many of you are in Professor Cannon's Utah history class? Okay, so quite a few of you are in Professor Cannon's Utah history class. And you've gotten up to the 1850s. Um, you may be coming to the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Like, here's a really interesting insight. There's a similar massacre 
over on the other side of the mountains in my state, in Colorado. It's called Sand Creek. And it was in 1864. Mountain Meadows was 1857. Sand Creek was in 1864. And historians generally think Sand Creek was the outcome of conflict between Euro-American settlers and the United States Army and American Indians for the grass, for the forage that they needed for their horses. Yeah, they were starting to come into conflict over a resource scarcity. Um, and, you know, Colorado likes to think of itself as a really wealthy state. They can get kind of smug out there. Um, but if you go to the mid-19th century, the Front Range, which is our version of your Wasatch Front, people were kind of poor. There was a gold rush there um, in, the, in the 1850s, and one historian believes that more wealth was put into Colorado than was taken out from the gold that they discovered. It was actually a sink for wealth. It cost a lot of money to feed people and bring supplies out for the miners to get the gold out. It was kind of a dry, high, cold countryside. And it was out of those, kind of those circumstances that produced that, that massacre. I wonder if something similar happened over here with Mountain Meadows. You got the Mormon settlers here, and they've got their farms and their pasturages here at the, at the mouths of the canyons. And then suddenly you've got all these other overland migrants coming through this area. And they stop off overnight, and they're pasturing their animals on the Mormons' pastures. Um, was that perhaps one of the flashpoints, the points of conflict that resulted in Mountain Meadows? I actually was beginning to wonder about um, the biological productivity of a largely dry state like Utah. I mean, I couldn't come up with any conclusive answers, but you see where I'm going with this. Things, these kind of things surprise me. And I sort of imagine, wow, if you could look at Utah from outer space, from a satellite view, an aerial view, how much of that landscape actually gets enough water to have enough biological productivity to grow food? And you think of these Mormon settlers out here with fairly large families, the population is rising. Um, can Utah's landscape sustain its own population? I think that had something to do with Brigham Young's decision to support the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, there were Mormon laborers who worked on the Union Pacific to help bring that line to completion. And I think Young probably knew in some way that this is a desert environment um, and had important benefits to the LDS church, but the population's growing, what are we gonna do? And the railroad became a kind of lifeline um, for, for Mormon civilization. Um, but it also, there's enough resource scarcity that if anyone else tries to get it, there's gonna be conflict, there's gonna be tension. So I think Sand Creek 1864 and Mountain Meadows 1857 might be rough analogs of one another. Um, there's a massacre here, there's a massacre over there. What do you think? Possible? Maybe you can discuss it with Professor Cannon. I might be wrong, but see, it's these kinds of things. It's these kind of questions that arise when you cross that boundary, when you cross the genre, when you say, yeah, I'm an environmental historian, but what if I look at the history of Utah um, from this perspective? What if I look at the history of the railroad from this perspective? What kind of insights, what kind of questions might this yield? Prize, that surprised me. There are a lot of other surprises, but that's one. Yeah. No, I think it just changes the way we're affected. So think about it today. Think of some of the major problems facing humanity. They are things like energy. Um, they are things like disease. They are, they are things such as fresh water. Um, the uh, population of the planet is approaching, seven, it's seven billion people at least, isn't it? Maybe it's gone beyond seven billion. Um, there are some demographers who are wondering if there in fact is an upper limit. And so all of these people are going to have to be fed. We're going to need food. We're going to need water. And there isn't a lot of fresh water on the planet. Um, disease is a problem, especially in a globally interconnected world. Um, it's no accident that um, people are very concerned about influenza strains coming out of Southeast Asia, for example. I mean, these things are not going to go away. They're here. 
Um, so no, I think the technology changes the terms. Um, you know, with global jet travel, it means those diseases can spread around the planet much more quickly, but the diseases are gonna be there. And so I think that these questions about humankind's relationship to nature, to its environment, are fundamental and are gonna remain, and I would argue are even gonna intensify. Um, they're gonna become more intense and they're gonna guide historians to ask questions about the past so we can understand our own present. Yeah, the technology changes the situation, but it doesn't make it go away. But great question. Yeah, did you have a question down here? Yeah. Besides, like, the geological aspects, the agricultural aspects, yeah. weather plays a huge factor. Yeah. And there were, and of course, though, I've read tons of, like, I've watched, like, documentaries on, like, weather events that change history forever. Like, there was this hurricane that struck New York in 1938. Or, okay. Or back in the Wild West in 1885, there was this deadly blizzard that nearly wiped out all the cattle, and that ended the cattle Okay. No, I think you're putting your finger on something very important, climate and weather. So now with global warming, a lot of historians are asking questions about the past. Is there anything that happened in the past, some kind of sudden climate change that would give us perspective on our own times? And of course now the problem is, the, is warming, but, but if you go back to the 19th, um, 18th, 17th centuries, there was a cooling. Um, there's a cooling period, and historians of early modern Europe are suggesting that this led to political destabilization. So the concern is that when the climate changes enough that it disrupts um, agriculture um, and, and so forth, um, that might lead to political destabilization. So yeah, climate is really important, climate and weather. And in the Civil War, it's really all important. Um, you can't really understand the conduct of the Civil War unless you understand the turning of the seasons, um, the effect of the climate and weather on the movements of military forces. So I think you're, you're asking something really important. Um, I guess my question is kind of the opposite of one that was asked earlier. Okay. Right. Correct. Well, I do with the railroads. Yeah, and uh, um, and again, it's not that it's not that the railroads eliminate nature as a factor. Um, they do overcome certain environmental limits, but they rather they ch they change the terms. I mean, if if. Uh, um, what do you do when the wood resources are exhausted, even locally for your locomotives? What if, you, what, what if there are none? It's no accident that the Union Pacific was a corporation that brought coal mining to Wyoming. Coal mining starts in the Wyoming because of the railroads. So it, it, it changes the terms in that sense. But I think the role of technology is very important. The kind of technology that's installed, it's very important. It's very important in extending American power westward. And I think it's all about people's relationship to the environment. Yeah, good question. Yeah. I had heard of this idea of peak horse. Uh, you know, okay, peak horse, cool. Sounds like we got peak oil that we're dealing okay. with. Okay. Or I'm worried about. Yeah. But, uh, so as peak horse was coming in uh, in the 20s, so you said that exactly. Yeah, it's about 1920, yeah. But then you had, and you're, you're increasing the pressure from technology due to coal, because coal had been with us since the, yeah. the 1860s. Did these two things combine? I'm naive here. So, okay, uh, okay. Uh, did these two things combine, and did they give us the depression? Because, because we have the dust bowl. Yeah. And were we trying to feed, were we find, trying to feed too many horses, whether they were both iron and flesh? Well, I think you're asking a great question. What's the relationship of these kinds of resources and their use to, here. yeah, an overlap. You know there was a, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think, well, maybe you could see it that way. I think the general explanation is that the transition to tractors in the 1920s, um, you know, it displaces a lot of, um, uh, you don't need all of that landscape for forage anymore. 
So if you have a lot of, if you have 25 million horses and mules, you've got to have a lot of landscape to produce hay and grain to feed those things. But once you get tractors and you're extracting the oil to produce the gasoline that can have those lightweight tractors, then what are you going to do with that extra landscape that once was devoted to feeding the horses and the mules? And that's when they plow it up. And of course, then it's the explanation that I think a lot of historians give. You're, you're, you're getting ever larger grain harvests and pouring these onto even a global market, and that drives the price down. The impetus then is to plow up more to make up the difference in the following, following per unit uh, profit that you're getting and so forth. And so that probably, um, the transition to the gasoline, the oil, oil power, probably was instrumental in, in plowing up the Great Plains and then that intersected with the droughts. So there, maybe that's a good way to put it, a perfect storm of, of converging factors that produce those conditions. That's an interesting insight. Um, yeah, I think there might be something to that. Right about the same time. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the American history, American history really is about um, resource extraction. Um, there's powerful incentives there and, a, and, a, and tremendous opportunities to get um, wealth off the landscape relatively easily, whether it's in the form of lumber, whether it's in the form of grass, um, whether it's in the form of animals of various kinds. I mean, that's one of the, the great things that makes the United States so, so wealthy and powerful, but then it starts to have consequences eventually in the form of soil erosion, dust bowls, and so forth. But, but anyway, I think you're, you're pointing to some very important things. Yeah. Other questions? So how are we doing for time? Is that, is that good? Okay, well thank you very much. Very good audience. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you.